Hi and welcome to the Open Tech Lab. Now in today's video I want to introduce you to the humble USB logic analyzer which is uh, a simple tool not without its limitations but it's still a tool that you can extract a great deal of useful information from whatever kind of digital system you happen to be working on. And what we're going to do in this video is we'll have a look at what a logic analyzer is, how it works and how it can be used with open source software specifically SIGROC. And the benefits of this is that it really lowers the barrier to entry. It means that anyone, even someone with a very modest budget, can still nonetheless pick up these things and start doing some really interesting projects. Now a lot of the hardware that I'm going to be showing off on this channel is available from uh, various Chinese sellers on eBay and AliExpress and so on. And I should say straight out of the gate that three out of the five logic analyzers you see here are clones of various commercial products, which in principle would not be ethical. But if we use open source software and take care to make sure we're not taking anything from the original manufacturer that we haven't paid for, then there's really no problem with using the hardware as it is. Now a lot of this is enabled by SIGROC, which is a cross-platform free and open source signal analysis software suite, which supports all kinds of various lab tools, including logic analyzers and oscilloscopes and various kinds of data loggers. And we're going to be using software from the SIGROC family very frequently on this channel because it's incredibly useful. It's also very close to my own heart because I spent a couple of years working as the primary author of PulseView, which is SIGROC's GUI for logic analyzers and oscilloscopes. So I'm really excited to be able to show this in action today, and hopefully you'll find out something new that you'll be able to make use of in your own projects. Now for those that don't know, let's have a quick look at what a logic analyzer actually is. And if you look at a logic analyzer, they're rather similar in many ways to an oscilloscope in that they sample the voltage on a series of inputs over time so that you can see uh, what the voltage does as time goes along. Except that in contrast to an oscilloscope, logic analyzers tend to have a lot more channels. This one has 8 and this one has 16. And they also are not capable of capturing a continuous range of voltages. They can only capture whether the voltage is at a low voltage, like below a certain threshold, and whether it's at a high voltage above a certain threshold. So this is useful for systems which are digital, so that you can see between zeros and ones traveling down a bus. And because they're so wide, because they have so many channels, you can track many, many signals which are in play in your device all at the same time. Now the best way to understand what a logic analyzer is and what it does is to see it in action. And to do that I've got a little test device here that we can try it out on. It's an old remote control for a set-top box that I don't have anymore. And uh, of course how it works is when you push a button it sends, uh, sends some signals to the target device through infrared signaling. So what we're going to do is we're going to attach the logic analyzer to this and see if we can capture the signals that it's sending and see if we can make any sense out of them. So the first thing we need to do is break this thing open. Well that put up a bit more of a fight than I was expecting, but now I've got the board out we can see that the device is really quite simple, it's pretty typical of a device like this, like a remote control. Uh, on the top side we've got these uh, the two IR transmission LEDs, we've got some battery clips, a big capacitor and this resonator. Then on the other side uh, we've got the uh, some kind of microprocessor under this blob of epoxy. Uh, this is chip on board construction and it's uh, you often see it in calculators and remote controls and low cost devices of this type. And then uh, we've got one or two passives and then uh, you can see we've got a few carbon tracks here and these, uh, these forked uh, structures here are the button pads and then on the underside of the, um, uh, the rubber keypad there are these carbon blocks that uh, make contact with these, with these structures and they act as switches. So it's really very simple. 
So to power this thing, I've hooked up my large and extremely noisy HP 6624A system power supply. And on the top side of the board, I've gone ahead and hooked up the connections to the battery clips, uh, positive and negative. And I've also attached the logic analyzer ground to this ground pin on one of the LEDs. And then on the other side here, I've soldered a little, um, little piece of copper wire to the drive transistor uh, and then attached the uh, yellow channel 4 of the logic analyzer uh, to that pin. Then if I want to transmit something, all I have to do is come in with a screwdriver and short out one of these button pads. So here you can see we've got Sigrock Pulse View running. And uh, to begin with, I've already got the logic analyzer selected and we've got the eight channels coming in uh, with the headings down the left. So the first thing I'm going to do is just go and disable every channel that we're not using. So I will accept channel four. And uh, I happen to know a little bit about the uh, about the signaling already. So I know that the uh, ideal sample rate is 500 kilohertz. And if I leave the uh, sample count at one mega samples, that will give us uh, two seconds of capture. Then if I set the pre-trigger capture ratios to 20%, that means that 20% of the signaling will be caught before the trigger point and 80% uh, will be captured after the trigger point. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the uh, trigger to come off the falling edge of this pulse. And then I can click run and then SIGROC is ready to uh, capture the signaling from the remote control device. Okay, so now let's go ahead and trigger this thing and see what happens. Excellent, it looks like that worked. So let's take a closer look at what we actually captured here. And to begin with, we can see that the system seems to be active low, uh, it's idle high here. And then we seem to have a series of bursts being sent. So let's zoom in on, on the first one and see what we've got. Now, uh, if we have a look at this in more detail, we seem to have a long burst of pulses here and then a series of bursts with varying gaps between them. So let's zoom in on this big burst at the start. Now, you can see here that this is just wiggling the, uh, uh, wiggling the LED on and off at a at a certain frequency. Let's measure that with the cursors. So I'm going to just drag that around one of these pulses here. And that seems to be uh, a frequency of around 38 kilohertz or so. So what it's doing is it's setting the LED on and off at about 38 kilohertz. And that what that does is it trains the receiver uh, the difference between on and off, which it can use to uh, track the amplitude of the uh, infrared uh, light that it's receiving. Then after that, we seem to have these uh, shorter bursts that are, um, how long are they in length? About half, a, uh, about half a millisecond, 479 microseconds. And then they're separated by different amounts. So this one is separated by about three milliseconds or so, 2.7 milliseconds. And the, this, uh, this long one over here is separated by about five milliseconds. So it seems that this is uh, this is how information is sent in this protocol uh, based on the uh, the amount of time between the pulses. So for example, a short a short gap might indicate a zero and a long gap might indicate a one or vice versa. Then later on, we seem to have these follow-up pulses, which just have a single pulse after the training pulse. So I think these are used for the remote control to indicate that the button is still held down. So we've already managed to extract quite a lot of useful information here. Certainly, we've got enough information to be able to re-implement our own version of the transmitter if we wanted to. Now, ideally, I'd like to show off SIGROC's protocol decoding support. And uh, SIGROC already does have some built-in support for decoding uh, two common IR uh, transmitter standards, NEC and RC5. But it doesn't look as if uh, this, uh, this transmitter is using either one of these standards. So I think this might be a custom job, just unique to this one remote control. I, I'm not that familiar with the different standards that are out there, so maybe it's a standard, maybe it's not. But anyway, I'll show off SIGROC's decoding capabilities in more detail later on. So there's a little introduction to logic analyzers and the sort of things you can do with them. Now let's have a look in a bit more detail at this specific model of logic analyzer. 
So this particular logic analyzer is a clone of an obsolete product made by the company Saley. Now I recommend you go and have a look at Saley's product lineup. They have a range of different products at different price points. They're very, very well made and uh, they come with some very high quality software, but they are quite pricey for what they are. And anyway, this is the Open Tech Lab and we always try and use open source software if we can, even if the quality doesn't quite match the proprietary alternative. And the reason for that is that having open source software gives you freedom and agency and control over the software and what it does in a way that you never get with proprietary software. If you can solve a problem with open source software, it's something that's free for you to use and always will be. It can never be taken away from you. And that's quite an important aspect of the philosophy behind this channel. Now, if you're interested in purchasing one of these devices, you can usually find them on AliExpress or DHgate or eBay. Just put in the search term 24 megahertz logic analyzer and you should be able to find them selling for around $7. Usually the shipping time is a few weeks, but if you put your order in soon, it'll have arrived by the time you need it. So if you were to go ahead and order one of these uh, Saley clone logic analyzers, let's have a little look at what you would receive in the package. So I'm just going to cut this open here, let's pour out the contents. And you see we've got the logic analyzer unit itself. Uh, we've got a little uh, ribbon cable here, and it can be broken into individual wires. And uh, we have a USB cable. Now, in my shipment, uh, the USB cable is completely awful. In fact, every time I've tried to talk to a USB device through it, it's failed completely. So we need to get rid of this, throw it away, it's no use. So to gain a better understanding of what these devices actually consist of, let's do a quick teardown to find out what's inside. So to get into these things, it's pretty simple. We can just insert a screwdriver and pop the lid off. There we are, and we can find inside, there isn't much to it, just a single PCB. Now there's quite a lot of flux residue left on the inside of this thing, so I think I'm going to give it a quick clean up before we have a look at it in more detail. Well that's quite a bit better. Now let's have a look at what we've actually got here. Now on the back side there isn't much to see, just this, uh, just this little voltage regulator here. And if we flip the board over, on the top side there's just one major chip, this uh, Cypress CY7C68013A USB 2.0 microcontroller. And we'll have a look at that in a bit more detail in a second. Uh, then there's this uh, buffer, uh, this 8-channel buffer chip, which protects the microcontroller from uh, the signals coming in at a static and um, uh, excess voltages and so on. And then over here, there's a tiny, tiny little uh, EEPROM memory chip that contains the USB uh, device ID, the vendor ID and product ID. Uh, and then there's a little crystal and that's about it. Now this design exactly matches the original product from Saley and given that it's so simple, it's really no surprise that these clones can be made at such a low cost. So let's take a closer look at the Cypress USB microcontroller. Now this particular one comes from the EZ USB product family and uh, also known as the FX2 family of chips from Cypress. Now the main trick that this uh, device has is that it has a fast path between USB, high speed USB, and a parallel bus which can be 8 or 16 bits in width. And it has built-in hardware which can take the contents of a USB bulk transfer packet stream and unpack it sequentially onto the bus which it can feed out of this FIFO here. You, and it has this fancy block called the GPIF which allows it to uh, implement various kinds of signaling that various types of uh, parallel buses might need in order to glue them together. So it can play out USB packets out of the parallel bus and it can also do the reverse where it uh, reads in the parallel bus and packs the data into bulk transfer packets and sends them off to the PC. Now the uh, logic analyzers exploit this trick by setting it up to just sample the bus asynchronously at a certain clock frequency. Now the maximum transfer rate that this thing can sustain continuously is 
24 mega samples per second in 8 bits bus width and uh, 12 mega samples per second when it's set to the double width 16 bit transfer width. Now another interesting feature of this device is that the whole operation is uh, supervised by this 8051 core. And uh, the 8051, for those that don't know, is uh, quite an old, uh, old-fashioned 8-bit uh, processor design. And uh, the interesting thing about the 8051 core in the, uh, in the FX2 chips is that it isn't, uh, the software isn't programmed in any kind of uh, EEPROM or flash storage. Instead, the software is loaded into RAM when the device is first connected. So when the device is first connected to uh, a PC, it comes up as a sort of generic unprogrammed device. And then the driver has to uh, sense this and initiate a download of the device firmware, which is loaded just while the device is still up and running. It downloads the firmware and then the device goes away for a while and resets itself. Uh, and then when the device comes back up again, the 8051 core is running uh, with the firmware that was downloaded into the device. So a consequence of this is that uh, depending on the firmware that's loaded into the device, we can make it do all kinds of different things. And in order to make the device work with open source software, to have a completely open source solution, we just need to make sure that we're running some open source software in the 8051 core and not using any binary blob that comes from pr some proprietary software suite. So Sigrock has an open source firmware for Cypress FX2 chips. It's called FX2 LAFW, which stands for FX2 Logic Analyzer Firmware. Now if you're using Windows, you should find the FX2 LAFW firmware built into the Windows package file that you download. If you're on Linux, depending on which distribution you use, you may find a package for it, or you may have to install it manually. Whatever you're using, just follow the instructions that are listed on the Sigrock wiki. And not only does it support the Sailey device, it also supports a large number of other devices made by many other manufacturers that do the exact same trick using the same chipset as the Sailey device does. Also among this list, there are some slight variations in the capabilities of the different devices. For example, this device is a Chinese clone of a product made by a now defunct company called CWAV. And this product adds dual analog inputs to the logic analyzer, so it can proudly proclaim itself to be a mixed signal oscilloscope. Now in reality, the device doesn't have proper analog probes that you could attach scope probes to. All it has is flying leads, just like the logic analyzer. So the signal integrity on the analog input is absolutely hopeless. Added to which the sample rate and bandwidth compared to a real oscilloscope is tiny. So the analog inputs on this device are really not of any use at all. However, it's interesting to see how different engineers have taken the FX2-based architecture in different directions. So let's lift the lid on this thing and see how the design compares to the other unit. So you can see we've got the FX2 microcontroller here. It's in a slightly different package, but it's still the same device. We've got the eight digital channels coming in here through this resistor network, and they're tracked up to the... Uh, 8 bits of the parallel bus coming into the FX2 on this side. And then the other 8 bits of the parallel bus are wired to this 8-bit analog to digital converter, which takes its input from uh, this analog section here. Uh, there are two input buffers here and here, and there's this analog switch. Now, the reason this is here is that it's possible to uh, sample from either of the analog inputs. It could be switched to sample from this one or it could be switched to sample from this one. And uh, if the user desires, it's also possible for the FX2 to cause the switch to chop between the two inputs, between samples. So you sample one sample from this input and one sample from that out, uh, this input. And that's how uh, the device is able to support dual channel analog. Now another device that FX2 LAFW supports are the Cypress FX2 breakout boards and they can be used as logic analyzers just like the Sailey devices and uh, because they have every pin of the microcontroller broken out onto headers it's also possible to use them as a 16-bit logic analyzer if that's what you need. Um, but they don't have any buffering of any sort or any protection for the inputs, so you have to make sure the voltage you're reading is uh, compatible with the device, and uh, you may have to introduce some protection of your own. 
These devices are available quite cheaply. They're about $10 a piece and uh, you can get them from eBay and Ali AliExpress and places like that. And uh, they're also quite useful if you want to use some of the other features of the device, for example, the ability to uh, send data out as well as being able to capture it in. Uh, so it's well worth buying a couple of these uh, just to have in store, uh, just in case you ever need a way to uh, link your PC to whatever kind of system you're working on. So all of these logic analyzers share the same basic characteristics. They all offer 8 or 16 bits of bus width at up to 12 or 24 mega samples per second. Now each of these logic analyzers would be categorized as a streaming logic analyzer. They don't have any internal storage to speak of. Instead, every sample that's captured is transferred immediately to the PC. Now the streaming logic analyzer design makes for rather a two-edged sword. On the one hand, they offer infinite sample depth. There really is no limitation on how long the capture can go on for, except for the amount of storage available in the host PC. But on the other hand, there is a significant bandwidth limitation that comes from the USB bus. With USB 2.0 high speed, it's not really possible to make transfers at faster than 200 megabits per second. And in addition to this, if there's any congestion on the USB bus, if the host PC gets busy for whatever reason, or, or someone tries to talk to a printer on another connection, this congestion can result in a temporary interruption to the capture, causing an underrun. And in this event, the capture would have to stop, because otherwise there would be a gap in it. Now, some devices have a little bit of memory that they can use to cope with brief interruptions to the transfers. But the Cypress FX2 only has a few kilobytes of buffer space, so even a tiny interruption will more than likely cause the transfer to halt. And so the problem that's shared by all the FX2-based logic analyzers is that they become quite unstable when running at the highest speeds. If you run the logic analyzer at 24 mega samples per second, it depends very much on the machine you're running on and, or what it's doing as to whether the transfer even manages to continue for more than a few seconds before halting. And this becomes quite limiting because the Nyquist criterion states that whatever signal you're trying to capture can't have a bandwidth of more than half the sample rate of the logic analyzer. So for example at 24 mega samples per second, if you managed to sustain that, you'd still only be able to capture a signal that had 12 megahertz of bandwidth at most. And in reality, to get the best results, you really need to oversample a little bit. So you'd really want to avoid capturing a signal with more than 6 megahertz of bandwidth, which is not particularly fast. So what if we want to go faster? How can we get more speed? One approach is to have less channels. These days, it's very rarely the case that you'll need a full 16 channels for whatever you want to capture. Often you don't need eight. Often four will suffice, or even two. Back in the 80s and early 90s, parallel buses were all the rage. Most computer devices communicated only through parallel buses. But these days, serial protocols of all kinds are becoming more and more common. So often, having a large number of channels isn't nearly as important as having a small number of very fast channels. So I have here another device that attempts to cater to this need. This is another Chinese clone of an obsolete Sailey product. This device allows you to sample at 25 mega samples per second with 8 channels, at 50 mega samples per second with 4 channels, or at 100 mega samples per second with just 2 channels. So to find out a little bit more about this device, let's lift the lid and have a look inside. So let's get this off here. Now, if we have a look on the top side of the board, you can see we've got this 16-bit buffer chip here. This protects the uh, inputs of the device from any kind of spurious uh, excess voltages and whatever, much like in log other logic analyzers. Then if we uh, look on the uh, reverse side of the board, you can see we've got our old friend, the Cypress FX2 right here. Uh, now, if we have a look on the top side of the board, uh, you can see we've got this Xilinx Spartan 3 FPGA. And if we look at the wiring here, you can see that this device is linked on one hand to the, um, uh, to the input buffer, and then uh, through via holes on the back side of the board, the FPGA is linked to the FX2. So the, uh, the FPGA here is sitting between the input buffer and the FX2 chip. So what exactly is the function of the FPGA? 
Well, the FPGA is there for two reasons. The first is that it packs the data that's coming in on the inputs into uh, the USB microcontroller. So, for example, if you've got two channels selected, that means that uh, it's got to pack um, four sets of those two-bit values into every byte. And if you've got four bits, it's got to pack those into bytes. And if you've got eight bits or 16 bits, it's got to pack them in there. And that's how it's able to provide different speeds depending on the number of channels you have selected. And the other fu uh, function of the FPGA is that it depend uh, depending on um, whether there's congestion on the USB bus, this uh, FPGA has a certain amount of memory within it. This is the block RAM of the FPGA. And this means that if there's uh, any congestion on the USB bus, that means that the FX2 here can't uh, transfer for a brief period. Uh, it's not going to cause the transfer to halt because uh, the FPGA still has a, a bit of um, uh, buffering that it can do. It can accumulate a few samples uh, while the USB bus is busy and then it can catch up again later on. And this means that this device is... Uh, quite a marked improvement over the simple FX2 based devices. It's a lot more stable and it's a lot more reliable. Also, one more benefit to this device is that it has a configurable input threshold, which uh, also allows the device to be a little bit more flexible. So in terms of the logic analyzers in my collection, this one is about the best of the bunch. Now, if you're interested in purchasing one of these devices, you can find it on AliExpress if you search for 16 ch 100 megahertz logic analyzer you should be able to find them being sold at around the 30 dollars mark be aware that the design tends to change from year to year i suspect this is because chinese sellers want to keep the cost down as low as they can so they tend to switch things like the fpga and the board layouts and things like that but fundamentally the hardware remains the same in function and if you want to find out more about these devices and uh, what kind of firmwares you need to use and so on, just have a look at the SIGROC wiki for these devices and there's lots of information there. So if we're interested in sampling at even higher speeds or if we want to sample without cutting down the number of channels, then we have to say goodbye to the streaming design because as we go faster and faster, the rate of data flow becomes so high that it's simply not possible to transfer it back to the PC over USB 2.0. Now there are a few devices on the market that mitigate against this by not using USB 2.0 at all. For example, there are logic analyzers that are PCI Express based. And now that USB 3.0 super speed is coming in with its 5 gigabit per second transfer rate, we should see streaming designs achieve a much greater throughput in the near future. But at the moment, these streaming designs are quite highly priced. And they do put quite an extreme requirement on the host PC in terms of its ability to store away data in real time. So the alternative to a streaming design is to forget about the streaming design altogether. And instead of streaming it back to the PC in real time, capture the samples directly into some RAM within the USB logic analyzer itself. For example, some devices use the block RAM within an FPGA, some devices have external SRAMs, and some devices even have gigabytes of storage in SD RAM chips. These devices are of course limited by the number of samples that can be stored in the internal memory, but more and more devices with huge amounts of memory are coming onto the market, so this limitation isn't necessarily particularly problematic. So my one example of a store and dump logic analyzer is this device, the OpenBench Logic Sniffer. This is a completely open source, open hardware logic analyzer. Now this device is quite old now, this board has 2007 written on it, but nonetheless it still has some reasonably impressive specifications. It has 16 main channel inputs on the right here, and it can even uh, add another 16 channels on this header over here, there's no protection on this header, but when the two inputs are taken together, this gives uh, a total of 32 inputs. And when you sample at 16 inputs, it can capture at 200 mega samples per second, which means that on every single one of these 16 inputs, it can capture a 100 megahertz waveform. Now, if we have a look at the detail of how this device works, it's very similar to the Sailey Logic 16 clone. On the front side here, we have this uh, input protection buffer, then in the middle we have an FPGA, this one is a Xilinx Spartan 3E, which implements the store and dump functionality, and also all the triggering. 
And then over here we have this PIC microcontroller which interfaces between the FPGA and the USB. So this device can sample at quite high speed but in terms of the storage it has on board it doesn't have any storage apart from what's built into the FPGA block RAM. So there are no SRAMs or SD RAMs on this board here which unfortunately limits the sample depth to a quarter megabyte which is not as much as some logic analyzers have. So the most unfortunate aspect of this device is the presence of the PIC microcontroller here. Now other devices use USB high-speed transfer to get the maximum transfer of hundreds of megabits going over USB. But this device and the PIC microcontroller in particular are not capable of doing this. Uh, the PIC instead implements a protocol uh, using serial over USB so the transfer rate between the FPGA and the USB bus here is only a matter of kilobits. Now the good side of this is that it does implement a standard protocol for logic analyzers called the SUMP protocol uh, which is quite useful especially if you're uh, rolling your own logic analyzer for any of your own projects. SIGROC is compatible with any SUMP capable device but still the bandwidth limitation really really cripples the capabilities of this particular logic analyzer. Now you might be wondering why they would choose to use the very limited capabilities of USB over serial when they could use the full power, the full speed of a custom USB protocol. First is that unlike SIGROC, the software suite that the OLS ships with is written in Java, and in Java it simply isn't very easy to access devices over USB with anything other than serial. A second possible reason is that a few years ago in Windows it used to be very very difficult to access a raw USB device at high speed. The only way it used to be possible was through writing a kernel driver for Windows, which is a very difficult piece of software to write. And also it incurs various burdens, including the requirement for your driver to go through the Windows Hardware Quality Lab certification. So to keep things simple, a lot of device manufacturers simply avoid using the USB bus properly at all and instead use these simplified protocols that Windows has built in support for. But these days we have open source projects like LibUSB, which make it super easy to write user space drivers for all kinds of USB devices. So there really isn't a good reason why a modern device should do this kind of serial over USB thing rather than using the USB protocol properly as it was intended to be used. So that concludes my review of my little collection of logic analyzers. All of them are available for under $50. Now, it might be worth me updating my collection somewhat. There are one or two devices that are available from AliExpress that have higher performance than these, and uh, these are also available at reasonable cost. However, many of the newer clones that have come out are not yet compatible with SIGROC. Someone hasn't come in and done the work yet. And as I said previously, if the devices are clones of devices made by a commercial manufacturer, I do insist on making sure that the firmware that runs within the device is completely free and open source. So if you're looking for an interesting project to contribute to, I highly recommend picking up one of these devices and uh, you'll have the opportunity to write drivers for SIGROC and also work on some open source FPGA firmware if you find that kind of thing interesting. So now we've had a look at a few different logic analyzers, let's have a look at SIGROC and how it can use them in different interesting ways. Now for the purposes of this demo, I have this Altera Max 2 CPLD evaluation board. So this board focuses around the CPLD in the center here. It also has a little bit of SRAM and it also has our old friend again, the Cypress FX2. Now this is nothing to do with logic analyzers, I just happen to have a board and it just happens to have the FX2 on it. But what I'm really interested in here is this little EEPROM chip here which is attached to the FX2. And the purpose of this EEPROM, it can be used in one of two ways. It can either be used to store a complete firmware image that the FX2 will run, or it can be used simply just to store the USB product ID and vendor ID, which is the more typical use case, because typically uh, the firmware would be stored in the PC and only loaded at runtime. But both options are available when using the FX2. Now if we get up really close to this chip, you might be able to see the markings on the top here. It's a 24LC64 made by the company Microchip. It's an I2C EEPROM. 
So in this experiment, what we're going to try and do is see if we can capture the signaling between the FX2 and the I squared C EEPROM. So a quick word about probes. So we need the probes in order to hook the logic analyzer onto whatever metal features on the board, uh, be they the legs of some, uh, some chips or some pin headers or anything we can hook onto. And uh, there is a huge range of uh, probes available on the market at various price points and a huge range of the scale of thing that they can hook onto. And there's a really comprehensive page of information about the different probes available on the SIGROC website. So here I've just got two uh, types of probe here to show off. I've got the XKM series of probes on the top row here made by uh, EasyHook. And then on the bottom row, I've got some really low cost Chinese uh, hook probes. So on the top row, each one of these probes sells for about $2.78. And then on the bottom row, this whole group of five, you can buy for about 90 cents on AliExpress. Now in the Open Tech Lab, normally I'd want to recommend the lowest cost solution possible just to make the barrier to entry as low as possible for anyone who's interested in getting into open technology. But uh, unfortunately, these, these low-cost probes are simply not fit for purpose. They do not work. So to really understand the difference, let's have a look at these two probes side by side. So on the left here, we've got the XKM series Easy Hook, and on the right, we've got the Chinese probe. Now, you may be able to see the differences in the tolerances that this plastic molding has been produced to. So at the tip, we've got this really fine, fine, fine plastic point. Whereas on the Chinese probe, we have a massive stump. And then if we uh, actually push out the clips on here, you can see we've got these very thin little points of metal which come out and just cook around whatever you need to hook onto. Whereas the Chinese one has absolutely enormous hooks that pop out. And they're no good for hooking around anything that's uh, at all small. And the other problem is that the you may be able to see in this image that the uh, hooks, the, the actual hooks of the Chinese probe don't even close around particularly well. So these tend to just pop off immediately uh, the moment you try to attach them to anything. So they're completely useless and uh, uh, don't waste your money even though they're very cheap. So the full set of 10 easy hooks that you see here is available on DigiKey for $27.89 plus tax and shipping. It's uh, relatively expensive for a bunch of hooks, but unless you can go without hooks entirely, there isn't really a cheaper option on the table. And anyway, they're a nice product and worth spending money on. So here we have our test setup, and the first thing you'll probably notice is all this captain tape I've attached to the setup. Uh, it's generally a good idea when you're doing these kinds of measurements to tape everything down. It makes the whole thing mechanically so much more stable. It means that you're less likely to yank something apart. And uh, if you look at what I've got here, I've got the uh, Sailey Logic Analyzer clone uh, running the FX2 LAFW firmware. And then I've attached hook probes to the data and clock lines of the I2C bus on the uh, 24LC64. And I've also attached a probe to the power supply because that will allow us to trigger off the moment the USB supply voltage arrives. And that's about all there is to this whole setup. Okay, so let's prepare Pulse View to do the capture. So to begin with, I'm going to turn off all the channels that we don't need. That'll be 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And I'm going to set the pre-trigger ratio to 20%, so we can just see a little bit of time uh, before the trigger point. I'm going to do a million samples, and I'm going to capture at a megahertz. So that'll give us one second of capture. And I'm going to set it to the rising edge of the power rail. So let's just give uh, give this some text, 3v3. Uh, this is SDA, and this is SCL. There we go. Okay, so we're now ready to do the capture. Okay, so let's set the logic analyzer to capture here. And now I will add power. So let's plug this in here. <clears throat> There we are, we have a capture. So let's have a closer look at what we actually captured. And we can see the moment the uh, logic analyzer triggered as the power rail came up. And then a little bit further down, we can see there's some activity. And if we zoom in on that, we can see we've got a little packet of activity. 
uh, you can see the clock signal clocking away here and then we can see some data going back and forth. Now at the moment it's a little bit hard to really understand what's going on and I've, uh, I've spent quite a lot of my life counting out these pulses trying to figure out what on earth what on earth the two devices are saying to each other for various different projects. But with PulseView, things are much, much easier because of Sigrox's amazing decoding feature. So to begin with, we know that this is I squared C signaling. So let's add an I squared C decoder. So we'll add that. And because we already named these uh, SCL and SDA lines, uh, PulseView has picked that up and has assigned the probe lines of STL and SDA to the appropriate inputs of the decoder here. So let's have a closer look. So you can see on the top row here we've got the bits output of the uh, clock and data. So you can see this sampled on the falling edge of the clock line here. So you can see we've got lots of ones here. And then uh, on the bottom row you can see we've uh, got a little bit more semantic information about what is the meaning of those bits in terms of the I squared C protocol. So we've got a, an address read 50 and if we zoom in uh, a NAC saying that address read failed and then uh, the FX2 attempts to address read from 51 we get an acknowledgement and then we get some data and then we it tries to write to 51 and then there seems to be some back and forth between the two. Now, as you can see, it's a lot, lot easier to make sense out of the output of the decoding than it is just looking at pulses. So already we've made quite a lot of progress. But if we really want to understand what the chips are saying to each other, uh, well, we'd have to ha go and have a look at the data sheet of the 24LC64. However, Sigrock has this amazing decoder stacking function where we can decode the output of the first decoder. We can add a second level decoder. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'll click on this heading here and we'll press stack decoder and I'll select a 24xx EEPROM. And now we've got a more detailed decode of the meanings of these transactions in the context of the 24LC64. So you can see the first transaction here is it seems to be trying to probe a device on address 50 and getting no reply. And then it tries to probe 51 and well, clearly our device begins responding on that address. There's some warning here, but I don't think that's significant. And then down the line, it seems to do some kind of sequential random read at address 00, zero reading two bytes of data. And those bytes are 00FF. Zero zero and you can see the individual transactions where those two bytes are transferred are here. So it does seem like uh, the makers of this board have kind of put in a bit of an overkill with, with this 64 kilobit EEPROM, but all the same, it certainly contains all the data that the FX2 needs. So if you're interested in experimenting with Sigrox decoding features, Sigrox has a handy Sigrox dumps repository, which contains a whole load of pre-existing captures. And this repository grows and grows over time because the rule is that every time a decoder gets added to Sigrox decoder library, it must be accompanied with some pre-captured test data that other people can use to test the decoder out for themselves. For example, this file contains CAN bus data containing a sequence of packets. And if we zoom in on them, we can see the structure and the content of all the packets of these CAN messages. And in this capture, we can see data being read and written from an SD card. There are captures for all kinds of strange devices, including uh, this data captured from a Nintendo Wii nunchuck controller. And you can see button press events and accelerometer readings and all kinds of interesting information being transferred. So each decoder is written in the Python programming language. And typically, there are only a couple of hundred lines of code in length. So if you're working on something and it would be helpful to have a decoder to really see what's going on, it's really not very hard to jump in and quickly write one. And any submissions to the Sigrock decoders repository are always gratefully received because the goal is to have decoders for every chip imaginable. So now we've had a little look at PulseView, let's have a look at the lesser used member of the Sigrock family, which is Sigrock CLI, the command line client for the Sigrock software. So as with any good command line application, Sigrox CLI doesn't aim to replace the UI, rather it complements it. 
A command line application can be scripted so it will excel at tasks that are repetitive and tedious. And when the output is streamed through a Unix pipe, it allows the data to be processed and analyzed in all kinds of interesting ways. So let's give Sigrox CLI a little test. And to begin with, I'm just doing something simple. I've attached the Sailee Logic Analyzer clone to the probe compensation test clips on my oscilloscope. And on these clips, there is a 5 volt peak to peak square wave at 1 kilohertz. So to begin with, let's list the logic analyzer devices that are attached to the machine. So to do that, I'm going to do Sigrox CLI dash dash driver FX2 LAFW because that's the devices we're trying to list. And let's add dash dash show. And there we are. You can see we've got uh, one device here. Uh, Soli Logic clone with eight channels and it gives various information about the capabilities of the device, the sample rates that are supported and the trigger mode and so on. And uh, yeah, our device is showing up just fine. Okay, next up, let's capture some samples from our test input. So to do that, I'm going to do Sigrox CLI dash dash driver FX2 LAFW. Again, uh, I need to select the uh, sample rate and I'm going to set that to 20 kilohertz the lowest sample rate of the device uh, because of course our input signal is at one kilohertz i'm going to specify which channels i want to capture from i'm going to capture just from d naught and i'm going to select how many samples i want to receive and i just want 100. so with that we're ready to do a quick capture and there we are you can see it's printed out the results here as ones and zeros and we're sampling at 20 kilohertz and we're capturing a one kilohertz signal. So we're expecting to see sequences of about 10 zeros and about 10 ones alternating, which is exactly what we see here. We can also jazz up the output a bit by selecting the output type. So let's go and do that. And uh, we want to export in ASCII art. So now you can see the signal in ASCII art. Next up, let's try protocol decoding with Sigrox CLI. And to demonstrate this, I've reconnected my CPLD evaluation board with the Sailey Logic Analyzer clone. So first of all, let's have a little look at what's available in Sigrox CLI. So let's first do Sigrox CLI V and pipe the output into less. And here you can see all the different hardware drivers for all the supported hardware. And if we scroll down, we can see all the input formats that are supported, all the file formats that can be loaded, and all the outputs, including the uh, ASCII art format, which is right here, as we saw earlier. And uh, if we scroll down, we can also see a complete list of all the protocol decoders that are available. Now, if we want to find out more about a protocol decoder, we can do something like this. Sigrox CLI dash P, I'm going to select the I2C decoder, and do dash dash show and here you can see we've got all the information about the i squared c decoder uh, you know what annotation classes it has what binary data types it can export and it's the same for the uh, the, um, the eprom decoder the eprom 24xx decoder here and you can see we've got a complete list again of all the annotation classes and all the different types of information that can be exported by this decoder. So let's set up a capture. So to do that, I'm going to run Sigrox CLI with the FX2 LAFW driver again. I'm going to configure the sample rate uh, to 1 megahertz, and I'm going to select the channels uh, D0 and D1, which are the clock and data of the I squared C signaling, respectively. And this time I'm going to capture continuously. So there's no limit on the uh, there's no limit on the number of samples. And I'm going to decode with the I squared C decoder. And on top of this, I'm going to stack up the EPROM 24XX decoder. So let's do that. Now I'm going to activate the CPLD board. There we go, and you can see we've got a whole load of decoded data from the logic analyzer. Now what we're seeing here is a complete dump of every data field that the EEPROM decoder sends. So ideally we'd like to see just the annotations that are of interest. So in order to do that, let's add an option to filter the annotations that are emitted. So to do that I'm going to add dash A, EEPROM, 
24xx equals data byte. And I also want to see the warnings. So let's set that to capture. Okay, now I will connect the CPLD board again. There we go, and we got some messages. And if I reset it once more, we got some more, and I can keep activating it over and over. Now you can easily imagine that this data could be fed out into some other kind of script or through a Unix pipe into grep and you could extract all kinds of useful information from this output. So those are a few examples of how logic analyzers can be used to quickly extract data from any device you might want to test. But in all of these examples the signal speed has been relatively low, typically less than 10 megahertz. So the question we might want to ask is exactly how fast can we go? What's the fastest thing we could capture if we had a really fast logic analyzer? And to answer that question, we need to take a quick look at some of the issues involved in high speed signaling. Now there was a time when computer devices relied heavily on wide clocked parallel buses sending ones and zeros as TTL voltages. This was true of the ISA bus in the 80s and the PCI bus of the mid 90s. But if you look at the motherboard of a modern PC or laptop, you'll find that very little of the signaling is done this way. For example, let's have a quick look at PCI Express, which operates at frequencies of hundreds of megahertz or even gigahertz. What tricks are used to achieve higher and higher speeds? Well, for starters, PCI Express does away with the notion of a wide parallel bus of 32 or 64 data lines altogether. Instead, it uses a very narrow set of very high-speed serial signals, uh, 16 channels at most, but normally just one. Second, differential signaling is used instead of single-ended signaling. This is sometimes called LVDS, where two mirror image signals are sent down two separate wires. Now differential signals are far more resilient against rise time and ground bounce effects that plague single-ended signaling schemes. Third, the signal traces on the PCB have a certain amount of parasitic capacitance and inductance, which acts like a low-pass filter. The effect of this is to reduce the rise time of the bit edges and to cause quickly changing bit patterns to blur together. So to combat this, the transmitter passes the transmit signal through a high-pass filter to compensate for this effect. This process is called pre-emphasis. Fourth, the clock signal has been eliminated entirely. Instead, the receiver does clock recovery from the transmitter signaling by looking for bit edges and tracking those edges to regenerate a clock signal in the receiver. For this to work, there has to be a sufficient number of edges in the transmitted signal to ensure that the receiver has something to synchronize with. PCI Express 1.0 and 2.0 use 8B10B coding, where 8 bits of payload data are converted into 10 bits of data transferred down the wire, and no matter which 8 bits of payload data are being transmitted, the 10-bit symbol will always have a certain number of ones and zeros in it. There will never be a run of more than five ones or zeros in a row, which would cause the receiver's clock regeneration to drift in frequency. And this also helps prevent large continuous DC current flows between the transmitter and the receiver. Finally, on the board itself, the traces have to be carefully laid out using strip line or micro strip layout techniques to minimize parasitic inductance and capacitances and to maintain a fixed impedance along the length of the trace. Now my reason for mentioning all this is that when you look at a modern PC, pretty much all the communication that happens within it uses some or all of these tricks. Because whenever any kind of high speed signaling is involved, the medium that it transmits through has to be treated as a delicate analog system. And each of these tricks is designed to sidestep some pitfall involved in the physics of the trace of a PCB. But if you want to probe a high-speed bus like this, your probe becomes part of the analog system, and you can't ignore the effects it might have on the system you're probing. So let's talk about probing in general, which is the key issue for both oscilloscopes and logic analyzers. Because when you enter the realm of dozens of megahertz signaling and above, signal integrity becomes less and less robust. It becomes easier and easier to end up with a distorted signal coming into your instrument, or even end up distorting the signaling in the device under test. 
The key is to have high performance probes with low capacitance, low inductance and high impedance. The main problem with all these USB logic analyzers until you enter the thousands of dollars range is that all they offer in the way of probes is these flying leads which are really very primitive. Now to demonstrate some of the issues relating to flying lead probes, I've created a little simulation here in CircuitJS. Now CircuitJS is a really cool web-based circuit simulation tool which is based at Falstad.com. It's completely free and I recommend checking it out, it's very useful. So in this example I have a 4 MHz uh, input source that's uh, creating a square wave and uh, we have here a, an ideal uh, sink on the other end then we're seeing the voltage across this resistor uh, being displayed in the scope at the bottom and uh, we have a 50 ohm impedance transmission line linking the two and I've, uh, I've set the delay quite long so you can see the uh, signal propagating through the transmission line and uh, the source is uh, terminated with 50 ohms and the sink is terminated by 50 ohms and these are all ideal components so there are no reflections or anything like that uh, we're seeing uh, an absolutely perfect reproduction of the input signal in the output now in a circuit board this is representative of some digital signal being sent across the board and the transmission line represents maybe a strip line or a microstrip track uh, uh, running across the board transmitting some high-speed signal. So without any probe inserted into the system we can see that in our ideal situation everything is perfect. So to demonstrate the effects of attaching a logic analyzer to that transmission line I've modified the simulation here so I've divided the transmission line in two and uh, I've got here a crude simulation of what a logic analyzer might look like in analog terms. So the main feature of this are the flying leads represented by these two inductors and the characteristics of the logic analyzer itself represented by this resistor and capacitor. Now in this simulation uh, I've taken the values of uh, off the Saley website for the uh, resistance and capacitance so I think these are reasonable values and then the uh, 150 nanohenry seems to be roughly representative of what one might expect with a flying lead. Now where does this 150 nanohenry value come from? Well the answer is that uh, if you think about a piece of flying lead it is rather like a piece of a big coil, a big air wound coil and as a flying lead floats around in the air it, uh, it's hard to tell exactly what inductance it will produce, but it will produce a fair amount. So we can see the effect of the uh, inductance and capacitance we're adding as a load to the transmission line's response. So on the left, we see that the signal uh, that's being received in the sink here is ringing somewhat because of the effect of the logic analyzer on this system. And also the logic analyzer, the values, the, the voltage that's being seen here, is being plotted on the right on this oscilloscope and we can see that this too has quite a lot of ringing introduced into it. Now so far the effect of attaching the logic analyzer to this system hasn't been too bad so uh, you can see that uh, on the receive signal over here in the sink uh, there is some ringing induced and uh, the logic analyzer signal has quite severe ringing but this is well, it might be workable, it might be possible to extract some meaningful information out of this, despite the ringing. Um, but let's see what happens when we increase the uh, frequency of the inputs, that is to say, to increase the data rate of this system. So we're going to go uh, up by a factor of 5, and we'll multiply this, uh, uh, some, uh, this input frequency f uh, from 4 MHz to 20 MHz. Uh, for which you would need a 40 mega samples per second logic analyzer to test at least. Now let's go ahead and do that and see what happens. So obviously everything has got much worse. Uh, the signal in the receiver is still coming through reasonably okay with uh, the same ringing, uh, but it's more a more significant uh, percentage of the waveform that's being received. What's being received by the logic analyzer is looking really quite unintelligible at this point. I would be surprised if the logic analyzer could uh, correctly decide between the ones and zeros in this signal. Now if we go to a higher frequency, let's go up to our 100 megahertz, for which we would need a 200 megahertz logic analyzer, the Nyquist uh, criterion. 
let's see what happens now. Uh, now we can see that uh, the uh, signal is becoming really badly distorted in the receiver over here. In fact, it's not clear that uh, the data is going to come through without corruption at this point. And uh, what's being seen by the logic analyzer is a sine wave, um, which again is uh, very unlikely to be intelligible as meaningful data in the logic analyzer. And then if we go up to uh, say a 400 megahertz uh, uh, frequency in this system, uh, now we can see that, uh, uh, well, there's something coming through in the receiver here, uh, but in the logic analyzer, uh, the, uh, the the signaling that's being received by the logic analyzer up here is getting completely damped out. Uh, so the logic analyzer won't be able to see anything in this system at all at this point. So to get a little bit more detail on the issue, I've increased the time resolution of the, uh, the simulation by a factor of 10. So we can now get quite a good view of these uh, high frequency signals as they propagate through the, uh, through the simulation. And uh, in this case, it looks like the logic analyzer is not distorting the signal the receiver gets too badly. It seems to be coming through uh, in reasonable condition. So that's good. But the logic analyzer is receiving basically nothing. It's, it's got little more than just a DC offset. Certainly, it won't be able to receive any data out of this transmission line at all. So the question is, if we absolutely have to receive data at this speed, how might we set about it? And if we look at the analog simulation of the logic analyzer here, the dominating factor in it is the inductance of the flying test leads. So what can we do about that? And the answer is that we need to somehow find a way of reducing the inductance of our logic analyzer probes. And if we do that, let's have a look what happens to the, uh, uh, to the outcome. So I'm going to set this uh, down to 100 pico henrys, so really, really low inductance probe, and set the ground lead to also be uh, 100 pico henrys. So we basically cut the inductance by a thousand. Now at this point, it looks like uh, we're back in business in terms of the logic analyzer. I think these spikes might be a little product of the simulation, um, but we're basically seeing uh, data is being uh, still carried to the receiver in reasonable condition. And the logic analyzer is also able to see the data at the same time. And if you're interested in experimenting with the simulation yourself, you can find a link to it in the show notes, which are linked down below. So if we want to improve the signal integrity, what can we do that will reduce the inductance? And the answer is that we need to replace our flying leads and hook probes with something a little bit more involved. One example of a project like this is the original hacking work done by Bunny Huang a few years back on the original Xbox. In this project, he wanted to extract some of the secret cryptographic information from the Xbox device. And to do this, he wanted to snoop on one of the internal buses that connects the North and South Bridge chips together. Now this bus is a hypertransport bus. It's 8 bits wide, consisting of 8 differential signals and a differential clock signal that synchronizes the whole thing. Now this bus is very fast. It's clocked at 400 megahertz. So to be able to extract data from the device, he needed to create a custom probe board that he could solder directly onto the bus itself. Now if we look at the design of this board, we can see that it's really very simple. There is only one main chip on it, which is a transceiver. Its function is to receive the differential signals from the hypertransport bus and to convert it into single-ended signaling, which is sent on down to a FPGA board. And this FPGA board functioned a lot like a logic analyzer. It would just capture the signals off the bus as they were transferred. But by having the transceiver chip right down next to the bus, it meant that the tracks that connected the bus to the transceiver chip could be extremely short in length. And this, combined with having a ground plane under the whole board, was the key to reducing the inductance of the whole setup, which reduced the amount of loading that was placed on the bus and allowed the bus to continue working correctly while also allowing data to be captured off it. The transceiver chip would then retransmit the signals down a ribbon cable to the FPGA board, and the FPGA had a design implemented inside it which would simply capture the data off the bus and store it away in some RAM where it could be analysed in slow time later on. So this project is extremely interesting and is explained in much more detail in Bunny Huang's book Hacking the Xbox, 
where he explains in much more depth all the things he did to extract the secret information from the device. But my reason for mentioning all this is to show that it is possible to extract useful information from these kinds of high-speed buses, but as the speeds get higher and higher, the work required to make a viable probing setup becomes more and more and more, and at these high speeds it certainly isn't the case that we can just attach hook probes and flying leads and expect it to work, because it certainly won't. For example, on AliExpress, there are logic analyzers listed which claim to be able to sample at 4 or even 500 mega samples per second. And in the Sigrock wiki, there is this device, the Rocky Logic and 18E, which claims to be able to sample at 1 giga samples per second. Now, to produce a device like this is a pretty impressive feat of engineering, and the way they've used the FPGA and CPLD combination within the device is pretty impressive. But all of this is quite academic if the probing setup doesn't have the capability to transfer signals of these speeds. So when we're looking at the USB logic analyzers, they all top out at a couple of hundred mega samples per second sample rate. Now if we turn to the big name manufacturers and we've got a large amount of money to spend, there are some pretty impressive devices on offer. For example, this machine available from Keysight is available for a cool $12,000. And for that money you get a machine which is capable of sampling at 12.5 giga samples per second, which is pretty impressive but not as impressive as the machine which is available from Tektronix. If you can part with $79,000, you can buy yourself a machine that's capable of sampling at 50 giga samples per second. Now, of course, all of these devices are way outside the price range that is affordable for anyone except an engineer working for a very large company. But having said that, it's worth having a look at the probing manuals for these logic analyzers because there's some quite interesting information and advice about how to go about probing at these very, very high speeds. But given the amounts of money being asked for these very high-end logic analyzers and probes, it seems perfectly reasonable to shoot for a custom probe solution the way Bunny Huang did. And as Bunny showed, if you're creative and you go down this line, you can extract pretty much any information you need by contriving a custom solution at a much, much lower cost. So that concludes my little review of high-speed methods. Uh, but I want to come back and talk a little bit more about Sigrock the Project. Now, I first became aware of Sigrock the Project back in 2011. And at the time, I didn't have much experience with electronics. And it was something I was interested in learning more about. And Sigrock was a very vibrant project and they were doing all kinds of interesting things with low cost devices and allowing people with modest budgets to be able to develop electronic devices. Now at the time there were only three front ends for the Sigrock project. There was Sigrock CLI, the command line interface, which continues to be very important today. And there were two rather lacklustre attempts at a GUI, Sigrock QT and Sigrock GTK. Now, I had a look at the code and I wasn't very impressed and didn't think that these GUIs really seem to have a future. And I had a bit of a background in writing GUIs myself over a few years, so I figured I'd have a little go at writing one. And I thought, well, if I put a couple of months work into it, then this will start something new and it will be enough to get other developers to contribute and it will help to really jumpstart the GUI situation for Sigrock. Now, as you might imagine, a couple of months work turned into several years project. And in the end, it's my largest open source contribution ever. And as the months and years passed, initially I had support for logic analyzers and then analog support was added and support for properties of devices and adding support for decode and all kinds of refinements and things came in. And over time, more and more other developers started to patch on my code, which is a fantastic experience if you've never experienced it yourself, that someone else would look at what you're doing and think, well, this is something I want to invest my time in. This is something I like using and I'd like to see improve. And overall, I've done many projects down the years, uh, but only in recent years have I been doing open source projects. And of course, all the code I wrote as a teenager all got discarded. But this open source code is being used by large numbers of people and has growing numbers of contributors. Now, a couple of years ago, I found myself becoming more and more jaded with the project. After a couple of years of working on the same problems continuously, I found myself with all kinds of other ideas for projects that I'd like to try. So I began to step back from Sigrock and do other things. Now, that's not to say that I've abandoned this work. 
I think it will be something that will continue to contribute to over a very long time. But for the time being, it seems that mentally I'm not in the right place to be the main developer on PulseView. But the wonderful thing about open source, as I mentioned, is that many other people were interested in contributing to the project. And there's one guy by the name of Suran April, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, who has taken the project and run with it. And he has been adding all kinds of interesting features and patching bugs and reviewing contributions and really taking the lead with PulseView. So the work that I put in over a couple of years is by no means falling by the wayside. In fact, it's broadening out to a larger and larger audience of developers. So I'm really proud in some small way to have created some platform of code that others want to use and, and build upon and develop in further directions. Now, if you're interested in getting involved in an open source project, I can't recommend Sigrock enough. And the reason I say this is because Sigrock is quite a lot broader than most projects. Not only does it support logic analyzers, as we've been looking at today, but also oscilloscopes and data logging devices of all different kinds. And there are many ways to improve the project. If you can write C, you can write drivers for new devices. If you can write Python, you can write new protocol decoders. If you like GUI programming, there are many, many things that could be added to PulseView. And overall, the community is very friendly, and it's very well linked in with the open source hardware hacking scene in general. So if you're interested in learning about electronics, the sorts of people that you end up interacting with are people who you can learn a great number of new things from. So I highly recommend Sigrock, and I highly recommend you get involved in contributing to it. Well, that just about wraps it up for this video. I hope you found it interesting. I do recommend you get yourself one of these $10 logic analyzers right away. They are so useful to have. And uh, with Sigrock, you'll be able to do many, many things with it. And uh, in future videos, we're going to be doing a bunch of other experiments. And uh, hopefully, I'll be able to show off other ways to use Sigrock as part of that, uh, as part of that presentation. And uh, if you'd like to find out more about some of the things I've touched on, have a look at the show notes, which are linked down below. And uh, you'll be able to see links to various other things that uh, you might want to have a look at in more detail. And uh, if you like the video, give it a big thumbs up and subscribe. And I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And I hope to see you all next time. And thanks for watching.